Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you are in the world. And today we're pleased to have Professor Jinjie Yang here to give us our talk. And this is episode 10 of season two of the Martyr Society talk. I'd like to say a few words about the Martyr Society. It is an independent nonprofit organization for young scholars to build connections and have interdisciplinary exchange. We have PMS talks for academic research, WBA talk for the world beyond academia, and PMS workshop for skill set building. So for more information, please visit our website and subscribe to the WeChat and Twitter channels using the QR code. For any questions, also don't hesitate to email us. Thanks, Mo. So I'm very excited to serve as a co-host today for this PMS talk. Uh, this is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jingjie Yeo of Cornell University. Uh, Jingjie uh, received his PhD and bachelor degrees from Nanyang Technological University. In, in the meanwhile, he is a visiting research fellow at Brown University in 2013. That's where and when we meet with each other for the first time, right? So he did his postdoctoral, postdoctoral uh, research at both Tufts University and MIT, and he was a research scientist in the Institute of High Performance Computing in Singapore. He's now uh, an assist, assistant professor and head of this Square Lab for Engineering Living Materials at Cornell University. JJ is also a co-instructor at uh, in Station One, a social nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to building the foundations of the University of the Future through educational opportunities and socially directed volunteer at TM Education Research and Internships. He's uh, uh, editor in chief in STM Education. He was also named as one of the Journal of Materials Chemistry B's Emerging Investigators in 2020. So without further ado, I would like, I'm going to hand it over to JJ for his talk entitled uh, Towards Multi-Scale Computing Design of Bio-Inspired Smart Materials. Thank you. Yep, all right. So that's great. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction again. Uh, and also a very big thanks to the wonderful organizers uh, of the Mudler Society uh, for inviting me to this talk. And a very good morning to everyone. And thank you very much again for the opportunity for me to speak to everyone about recent developments in multi-scale computational modeling. And of course, the goal is to eventually be able to achieve truly rational bottom-up design of smart bio-inspired materials that are based on proteins. And I hope to convince everyone that this approach is actually vital for developing advanced biomaterials of the future to tackle global health issues. But very firstly, uh, my name is uh, Jingjie Yeo, but everyone usually just calls me JJ. It's a lot uh, easier on everyone. And I, I hit the J Square Lab for Engineering Living Materials. And um, I have my QR code uh, for my lab website, for my WeChat, for my email. So you know, at any time, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm very open to communications. Uh, and of course, looking forward to uh, making new collaborations, new friends as well uh, through the uh, Mullet Society. And just very quickly about myself, just to establish the mise-en-scene and you know, set the uh, uh, tone for the whole uh, presentation. So firstly, I, uh, as Kai mentioned, uh, I completed my B uh, PhD in 2014, uh, where I used molecular simulations to reproduce the nanostructures and thermal properties of silica aerogels and defective graphene. And in that same year, uh, after graduation, I also took up a research scientist position in the Institute of High Performance Computing, where uh, we actually collaborated very closely uh, with industry, particularly with Procter & Gamble, in my case, where we actually looked at uh, different biochemical effects of cosmetic form simulations on the human skin. And that was done using, again, uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And this collaboration was actually very, very successful. And we were awarded the best industry project uh, in 2016. And subsequently, in 2016, also uh, ASTAR, actually, uh, the organization that's um, kind of like a national lab in Singapore, actually awarded me a fellowship to do my uh, two year long postdoc in MIT uh, together with Professor Marcus Bueller. And uh, of course, given this wonderful opportunity, my research scope actually expanded tremendously, where I used uh, computational modeling to examine the multi scale properties of many uh, different biological and bio inspired materials. And of course, I also participated in many activities outside of research. And one prime example of this is an award for the uh, most inventive business idea at the Innovation at One uh, Business Pitch Competition. And in the latter half of 2018, I continued the same projects as a postdoc in Tufts uh, in the group of Professor David Kaplan. 
And simultaneously, I was also the uh, board member and editor of a number of different journals, uh, such as the early career board member of ACS Biomaterials Science and Engineering and the editor of the International Journal of Applied Mechanics. And right now, I'm also appointed the editor-in-chief of STEM Education, which is the inaugural uh, STEM Education Journal for the American Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And in the summer of 2018, I also had the incredible opportunity to work with Professor Christine Ortiz from MIT at a social nonprofit organization, Station One, where I helped to formulate the syllabus and co-instruct summer camps for undergraduates from underrepresented uh, communities. And we are finally getting started again for 2021 uh, after the stoppage in 2020 due to the pandemic. And uh, hopefully we have uh, another great uh, summer camp this year. And subsequently in 2019, I returned to IHPC uh, where I was a co-PI uh, on a project to develop different kinds of cutting edge silk cosmetics. But ultimately in 2020, I joined uh, Cornell University and that's where my group has grown since then. Uh, firstly, over here, I would like to acknowledge all the different members in my groups and uh, they have put in so much work in just in the first year of uh, joining my group. So firstly, we have my postdoc, uh, Chen Si, and I have my three PhD students uh, on the right over here. And we have two uh, master's students with us as well, and one undergrad. And then the bottom over here are some of my master's students who have already graduated actually. So they are actually now alumni in the group. And I'm very, very proud to say that they have very gone, they have gone very successfully uh, into industry. And both of them are actually uh, found jobs as data scientists or uh, software engineering. And of course, right now, um, the another main goal of my talk is to be able to seek new collaborations and to be able to uh, engage more with the scientific community as well. So given that my lab's research uh, is actually focusing on using different kinds of multi-scale computational techniques, but we have a very strong focus on molecular dynamic simulations, particularly that of reactive MD, non-reactive or classical MD, as well as coarse-grained mesoscale uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And these techniques are supplemented by other forms of computational techniques, particularly that uh, of DFT, uh, on the molecular scale. And we are also looking a lot into cellular modeling as well as finite element modeling. Oops. Now the overarching theme of my research group is on dynamic living materials, where we are actually looking at uh, the different molecular and nanomechanics of bacterial biopolymers. We are using our simulations to be able to design mutable polymeric structures. And we are also working on characterizing different kinds of dynamic biological phenomena, as well as designing dynamic nanomaterials. But given this really broad uh, scope, our lab's research is actually mainly motivated by a single complex issue. And that is the rapid aging of the global human population. Now, 2020 was not just a year of the pandemic, but the United Nations actually estimated that 2020 was also the year where the number of people, or rather the number of children under the age of five will be outnumbered by the number of people over the age of 65. And this rapid aging of the global human population has serious implications regarding the trends in human health, particularly that of non-communicable or non-infectious, non-transmissible diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular diseases, osteoarthritis, and neurodegenerative diseases. And of course, the recent pandemic has uh, been extremely disruptive and there's been a lot more focus on infectious diseases, but right now I think we still need to uh, refocus again back into these really important problems as well. Now, non-communicable diseases are not only rising, but the World Health Organization also estimates that their impact will become more severe and more burdensome for populations who can least afford treatments for these diseases. And therefore, there is an urgent need for us to dramatically improve the prevention and treatment of these diseases, especially by developing soft biomaterials that are adaptive and responsive at a low cost for drugs or drug delivery vehicles with specific targeting mechanisms, environmentally sensitive implants for tissue engineering, or for dynamic health monitoring. However, all these different applications poses significant challenges in the design of these biomaterials, right? They must be specifically designed to be stimuli responsive so that they are adaptable to their environment. They must be able to perform some form of cellular signaling or allow cells to proliferate. And they must also be biocompatible, biodegradable, and of course the holy grail will be bioresorbable as well. And yet there's such a large 
uh, design space that we must grasp in order for us to achieve such diverse functions. And we must also not forget that these biomaterials are frequently processed in conditions that are very far away from normal biological conditions, such as high temperatures and pressures, harsh solvents, and multi-step processes. Now, all these different challenges poses a critical research question. And that is, how can we actually rationally design the next generation of biomaterials to precisely obtain the properties and functions that we want? Now, in order to address this problem, my lab uses a unique approach through bio-inspired computational bottom-up design, where I harness material design principles that are developed by nature. And then we combine this with multi-scale modeling. And uh, we also use high throughput simulations to rapidly test and validate the properties of these materials for their subsequent uh, implementation. And using such an approach, I effectively have a closed feedback loop for bottom-up biomaterials by design, where the material functions can be iteratively derived from the atomic and molecular information that propagate throughout their multi-scale structures. And my long-term goal is to actually integrate all the elements that are required for a single cohesive multi-scale platform. And this platform will perform fast structure prediction, right? given a certain polymeric sequence using advanced sampling techniques and machine learned models. It can then determine a wide range of mechanical, optical, and electrical properties from these structures. But most crucially, it can incorporate any combinations of these external stimuli and make a holistic prediction of the dynamic responses of the biomaterial to capture its performance in a realistic manner. And therefore, we can actually derive predictive sequence structures and functions. Now, using this platform, we can truly check all the right boxes for the design of smart bio-inspired materials in order for us to tackle the global rise in non-communicable diseases. So in my talk today, I'll be touching on three key bio-inspirations for designing stimuli-responsive biomaterials. Firstly, it's going to be silk from silkworms, uh, which are strong and light. And secondly, I'll be touching on elastin, which is a protein that can be found in our skin, and as its name suggests, is a highly elastic protein. And finally, we'll be talking about the chromatophore of the sweet skin that produces dynamic coloration. And with these three examples, I will also go into more details on my current progress in assembling several key pieces of the design platform that I envision. Right? Essentially, how I've used advanced sampling techniques to be able to understand the structure, mechanics, and physical properties of these protein-based biomaterials. So let's dive in our first key bio-inspiration, silkworm silk, which is an ancient material that is both lightweight and tougher than steel when normalized by that density. And our use of silk as a biomaterial is motivated by the fact that to synthesize any form of materials, particularly soft materials for tissue engineering, we always need to account for trade-offs in their mechanical properties. So for instance, in this Ashby plot over here, we find that natural hydrogels such as cartilage are strong and resilient, right? And they tend to occupy the space uh, towards the right. And uh, whereas reproducing this combination of mechanical properties in synthetic hydrogels are highly challenging as they typically occupy the space more towards the left over there. Right? So there's actually an empty soft material space right in the middle over here. And it is fairly critical to fill this space with synthetic hydrogels in order to match the compliance of natural tissues more closely for biomedical uh, implants. Now, to fill this empty space, we take some inspiration from silkworm silk. Now, silkworm silk fibroids are basically long protein chains that alternates between amorphous regions and crystalline regions. Now, the crystalline regions confer mechanical strength through their high beta sheet content, which dissipates a lot of energy under heavy loads by breaking and reforming a high concentration of hydrogen bonds. And this is why silk fibroids are tougher than steel pound for pound. And essentially, beta sheets belong to a set of hierarchical structures that proteins may have. And all this very diverse set of uh, hierarchical structures helps proteins to enhance their mechanical strength. So for instance, these beta sheet structures dissipate energy through stick slip motion, as I mentioned. And other kinds of coiled protein structures can also act as springs or dampers. And therefore, I asked the question, how can we harness these protein structures to create similarly strong and resilient hydrogels? Can I actually 
harness these properties. And it turns out that we can, in fact, use certain chemical processing techniques to specifically induce the formation of these structures. I demonstrated this using molecular dynamic simulations with enhanced sampling methods. Now, could, to quickly recap the principles of uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations for those who might not be too familiar with it, right? In the vast majority of biomolecular simulations, we essentially model our bonded interactions between pairs of atoms with springs uh, for the bond stiffness. We have springs between triplets of atoms for angular stiffness, and we have torsional springs for dihedral stiffnesses, as well as uh, other forms of non bonded interactions, such as long range electrostatic interactions and short range uh, Van der Waals interactions. However, typical molecular dynamic simulations are generally limited by the tendency for the simulated system to explore very narrow regions of a rough underlying potential energy surface. And it's practically impossible to sample these uh, energy surfaces extensively in a reasonable amount of computational time. And a way to address this limitation is to actually run multiple replicas of the same system simultaneously over a broad range of temperatures. And after a certain amount of equilibration time, we perform a swap in temperatures between pairs of replicas. So our simulation now looks something more like this over time. Okay, But we do not swap the replicas every single time. And instead, there's a certain associated probability to performing the swap based on the total energy of each replica. And this probability is known as the metropolis acceptance criterion. And what this swapping effectively does is to allow the replicas to explore much broader regions of the underlying potential energy surface while eventually quenching the baseline replica ever closer towards the lowest possible energetic minima. But still, Plain vanilla replica exchange MD still suffers from poor scaling due to the very large numbers of water molecules in each replica. And this is very typical uh, for biomolecular simulations. And these water interactions dominate the calculations of the exchange probability such that in order for us to obtain any kind of meaningful exchanges, we would need such a large number of replicas to be extremely computationally expensive and inefficient. So a way around this is, is to eliminate the accounting of water interactions by reformulating the total energy term. And now in our exchange criteria, we no longer need to account for water interactions. And we dramatically reduce the number of rep uh, replicas that are needed. And now we only scale with the number of atoms of the protein itself. Okay, so now with this enhanced sampling method in hand, I can now effectively look at how chemically processing silk with different kinds of solvents can lead to tunable aggregated conformations. Now, using multiple strands of silk-like peptides that I've uh, generated uh, and is generalized by this GAGAGS sequence, and I solvated them in water, or I solvated them in HFIP followed by mixing with water. And here we look at snapshots of five different classes of silk after processing and solvation in water. Uh, in only water induced hydrophobic aggregation, right? And this is expected because uh, that's, that's how, it, uh, how uh, silk will uh, react in water, right? Uh, and they form amorphous structures. And on the other hand, solvation in HFIP actually prevents hydrophobic aggregation, but it also seeds certain small amounts of beta structures in the random network. And if we further add water to this metastable state, it will drive the system towards gelation very similar in effect to amyloid fibrillation by perturbing uh, saturated protein solutions. And then we can see a concomitant increase in beta sheets and interchain hydrogen bonding. And such a scheme was actually realized experimentally by my collaborators, and we termed this the binary solvent induced confirmation transition. And the top half of this procedure over here should be a fairly standard protocol to those who are familiar with it, where silk is degummed, dissolved, uh, dialyzed, freeze dried, and redissolved in HFIP. And the bottom half is where the gelation occurs by dripping deionized water into the solution. And upon incubation and washing, we actually obtained strong and tough all silk hydrogels with variable optical properties depending on their processing conditions. And they are mechanically robust and deformable. And therefore, we actually achieve excellent tunable mechanical properties without any form of chemical cross linking. 
And we took this concept further by incorporating sustainable materials from nature to obtain electrically conductive uh, flexible silk films. We added wood or chitin that were uh, processed under high temperatures and pressures to obtain activated aromatic carbons that were electrically uh, conductive. And by dissolving these components and casting them into films, we obtained thin and flexible silk films that were electrically conductive. Now, by adding such small amounts of bio-based activated carbon will dramatically increase the ductility and the toughness of the films. But of course, as we added more, we trade off the properties between carbon and silk until the film becomes very brittle, but very electrically conductive. And therefore, we were actually curious to know how does the molecular composition of chitin or wood-derived carbon influence the mechanical properties? And from X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, we actually determined the structure and doping content of activated carbon, where we found that wood-based carbon is generally oxygen-doped, while chitin-based carbon is both nitrogen and oxygen-doped. Now, this different doping changes the binding strength to carbon. So we modeled the randomly doped carbon and uh, the different silk structures. And then again, we applied that advanced sampling uh, molecular dynamics uh, method to actually determine the structural changes. And again, we very clearly saw that uh, by adding these different uh, wood-based structures, it actually reduced the uh, stiff beta sheets and increased the ductile coils. And if you recall, these different structures gives different mechanical properties to the silk film. And therefore, we do not just achieve all these uh, properties without any form of chemical cross-linkings, but we also produce electrically conductive, biocompatible, and very sustainable uh, materials. And having observed all the different mechanical properties, the electrical properties, now we are also looking into the optical properties. Can we actually tune the optical properties of such silk hydrogels? And it turns out that we can, in fact, again, use different forms of chemical processing of silk to derive different sorts of structures and uh, using, again, molecular dynamic simulations uh, where we isolated silk in different ionic solvents, in formic acid, as well as methanol. We find that we can very finely tune the different secondary structures that are found in uh, the proteins. And therefore, this actually produces different structures where we change the radius of gyration, the solvent's accessible surface area, and as well as the uh, tuning the number of hydrogen bonds. And very clearly, methanol has a very, very strong effect uh, on the structure of silk. And this is, again, is very well known, but we actually managed to explore this uh, using molecular dynamic simulations. And here is a visual of how uh, using methanol processing, we can actually get a very dense and strong uh, silk uh, aggregation. And again, such a property was uh, reproduced uh, using uh, experiments where they use a uh, vacuum-based solvent exchange to exchange the solvents between the ionic liquid as well as methanol. And they cast this into a silk, uh, silk film. And we were they, my collaborators were actually able to cast them into very interesting structures and be able to cast them such that we actually exhibit birefringence in the silk films. And these birefringence properties are uh, also strongly matches that of uh, finite element simulations that, that are again uh, done by uh, one of my collaborators. And uh, basically, we found a very strong color correlation between the stress states uh, of these particular structures. And this correlates very well with the finite element simulation. So now we have a very strong uh, kind of a, a, a storyline that goes from the molecular dynamic simulations and the processing of silk, and then eventually how we can cast them into different kinds of shapes in order for us to get different sorts of properties. And therefore, we were actually able to produce birefringent, oxetic, and biocompatible materials using such an approach. Now, what if we were to take this concept even further, right? Having the, the different mechanical properties, the different uh, electrical properties and different optical properties, can we actually incorporate other kinds of proteins to mimic other forms of biological material properties? And the protein that we chose to incorporate is called elastin, which is a protein that is commonly found in the human skin. And we chose elastin because elastin has unique responsive properties. Now, elastin-like peptides are composed of GX, GVP, uh, amino acid repeats as shown over here. And this is derived from the hydrophobic domain of a protein called tropoelastin. Uh, 
at low temperatures, elastic light peptides are soluble in aqueous solution, but as the temperature is raised above a transition temperature, they become insoluble and they will start to aggregate. And this process is typically reversible so that uh, subsequent cooling will actually resolubilize the elastin like peptide. And if we were to actually copolymerize this with the silt like peptides, we hope to couple the two properties of tunable mechanical properties with this reversible uh, stimuli response. And what we get is a copolymer, right? And it's given by this nomenclature, uh, SNEMX, where N and M denotes the ratio between the number of silk to elastin blocks. And X over here is actually an important variable amino acid in the elastin domain. And this is because the X amino acid will determine the sort of responsive properties that the resulting biomaterial will have, whether it changes with temperature, with pH, or enzymatic uh, recognition. And these tunable properties actually allow uh, the silk elastin like peptides to be useful for a very, very broad variety of biomedical uh, applications. So uh, my experimental collaborators synthesize them into a very wide array of morphologies for different engineering applications, whether it's stimuli-responsive hydrogels, fibers, and we are casting them uh, into films, into membranes. And right now we are also even looking into different sorts of functionalization to be able to induce different forms uh, of stimuli responsiveness. But because of this really broad multi-scale design space that goes from the specific amino acid sequence to the macro scale response, an important design question needs to be answered. And that is, can we actually predict the macro scale stimuli response from the mesoscale structures while still incorporating molecular chemical details? And the approach that I took was coarse graining. And coarse graining is a reductionist approach where only the important structures or details that needs to be captured are modeled. And this reduces the number of interactions to be computed, and it also smoothens the underlying energy surface for faster statistical sampling. And therefore, we actually get two birds with one stone. And what we need here is a coarse grain model that can capture conformational changes in the protein backbone, meaning a model that can fold protein structures. And for this purpose, I chose to use a potential known as the plum potential, which incorporates both bonded and non-bonded interactions, such as hydrophobicity, dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonds. And therefore, we can effectively combine the mesoscale structures with molecular chemical details. And to validate the ability of the plum potential to capture the temperature transition of cells, as well as to demonstrate the efficiency of sampling, we first obtain experimental data using differential scanning calorimetry and dynamic light scattering for comparison. And from these two curves, we can see that the heating curve for a single molecular uh, SE8Y, so if you recall the nomenclature, this is one block of silk to eight blocks of elastin. And we can show that there's a transition temperature of 294 kelvins. And similarly, from DLS data, there's a significant shrinkage of the hydrodynamic radius from 4.3 nanometers to 1.3 nanometers as we increase the temperature. Now, by folding the protein with fully atomistic molecular dynamic simulations, the transition appears to be captured as well, but this transition is very small with quite a lot of noise in the data. Now, in contrast, my coarse grain results show a very distinct transition that's close to the experimental transition temperature for both the radius of gyration and the solvent accessible uh, surface area. An observation of the molecular structure over here also shows a collapsed structure from a somewhat more elongated conformation at low temperature. And the amount of noise in the data was also significantly reduced. And thus, we show that this coarse grain model achieved both a speed up in sampling as well as improved accuracy. And we also plot the contact, map, uh, contact maps before and after the structural transition. And the contact map is basically a matrix which shows which residues are close enough to be in contact with each other within the protein. And it shows that the cell molecule basically remodeled itself after the structural transition and increased the number of contacts with neighbors that are much further away. And therefore, it became much more compact in structure. Now, for further validation of our model, we also looked at the transition of another self-construct. And now we are looking at S4EY. And by increasing this uh, silk to elastin ratio, uh, the DSC uh, DLS data shows that increasing the ratio will fully suppress the structural transition. <clears throat> 
And similarly, our cost grain simulation so, show that there are minimal changes in the radius of gyration at solvent accessible surface area compared to the very distinct changes that we saw initially in SE8Y. So once again, this demonstrates the very effective ability of our cost grain model to capture the structural transitions for different kinds of cell constructs. Now, when the cells are cast into hydrogels and cross-linked with host radish peroxidase, both the structural transition in SE8Y and the suppressed transition in S4E8Y becomes very clearly observable. However, here we also faced another perplexing problem. If the, cross, if the, if the hydrogel are cross-linked at much higher concentrations, the structural transition also becomes strongly suppressed. And in this case, you can see from this figure over here that the decrease is more than fourfold if the concentration increases from 2% to 20%. So clearly the concentration strongly affects the performance of the hydrogel, but what exactly is the fundamental mechanism that inhibits this transition? And therefore, my final broad aim of constructing a cost grain model is to be able to explain the concentration dependence of the thermal response. So I developed an algorithm that successively locates uh, solvent exposed tyrosine side chains of a single cell molecule. And I cross link two such side chains together. And this mimics both the tyrosine cross linking that's catalyzed by host radish peroxidase, as well as an increase in the concentration of the hydrogel. And therefore, we actually provide a representative region of the full cell hydrogel. And again, if we were to perform the same temperature sweep again, we can see a very similar trend in terms of the experimental data uh, of the significant suppression of the deswelling at high concentrations. Now, by analyzing the change in potential energy, the suppression of the transition can be explained by the individual cross-linked molecules encountering much higher energetic barriers such that above the transition temperature, the energy curves actually diverged such that each molecule in the crosslink model had much higher average potential energy than that of a single cell molecule. And therefore, these intermolecular interactions actually inhibit the remodeling into more compact structures. And this is observable, again, from the contact maps, where there's a minimal increase in the number of contacts with neighbors that are much further away uh, in cross-linked clusters, in contrast to the very large increase in contacts for a single cell molecule above the transition temperature. So to just very briefly summarize what I've discussed so far, I systematically studied the mutable structures of silk and silk elastin proteins subjected to different solvents or different temperatures, and my atomistic to cost grain models accurately captured structural transitions and transition temperatures with heavily improved sampling and less noisy data. And we can actually now infer simple principles to design and process proteins to tune the properties of these stimuli responsive biomaterials uh, for different sorts of biomedical applications. And right now, we are also greatly advancing the state of art in modeling silk and elastin, where we are furthering the uh, historical push towards higher spatial temporal scales. And the chemical complexity has also greatly increased concurrently, right, uh, going from a very old uh, historical models of simple peptide models of elastin to much larger and larger models of silk elastin copolymers. And right now we are leaping forward and pushing on these frontiers. And we are now able to incorporate even greater uh, diversity of functional groups onto the side chains in order to uh, develop new forms uh, of stimuli responsiveness. And we have more types of solvents and processing conditions to manipulate the properties of these proteins. And finally, this will feed into a mesoscale model of gel networks so we can study realistic physical chemistry and mechanics of gel networks and correspondingly be able to dive deeply into the empty white space that intersects biophysical chemistry and engineering mechanics. But at this point, we may ask, how about other properties of biomaterial, especially in terms of the optical properties? Can we actually make the same leap forward into designing bio-inspired uh, optical materials? And in order to answer this question, I turn to my final bio-inspiration for today, squid and its color cells, the chromatophore. And the motivation for this is that we would like to develop advanced optical devices, right? They are driven by the rapidly increasing demand for thermal electronics and biosensors that you can easily slap on and peel off to monitor your health, such as uh, glucose levels or other kinds of biomarkers such as cortisol. 
Now, correspondingly, many stretchy, uh, stretchy electrical devices were developed to take on this challenge, with one of, the, uh, one of the most recent being able to pack more than 6,300 transistors onto a tiny patch of stretchy polymers. Can we also incorporate optical displays and achieve highly flexible dermal optical devices? And soft robotics is one of the key prominent areas that's been uh, attempting to fuse uh, soft flexible materials with changeable optical properties, especially uh, in some cutting edge work that's already being done here by Professor Robert Shepard uh, over here in Cornell University in my department of uh, MAE. What if we could fabricate thin compliant materials such as those in the skin of the squid, right? In order for us to achieve instantaneous multi-hued biophotonic materials. Now to achieve this, we need to have a deep understanding of the precise multi-scale mechanisms that underlies this remarkable biophotonic material. And together with collaborators in Northeastern University and Marine Biological Lab, we actually uncovered this multi-scale mechanism with unprecedented detail. Now by shining a light on the chromatophores as it actuates, my experimental collaborators found that it does not just present chromatic coloration, it also iridesces simultaneously. And this observation actually runs against the grain because usually iridescence originates in iridophores. They are located in a separate region, such as beneath the pigment cell. And therefore, for us to fully unravel the structure and function of the squid chromatophore, we start going down the metaphorical rabbit hole. So my experimental uh, collaborators punched out and sorted the chromatophores according to their different colors and then they were stained and imaged. And here we find a key piece of the puzzle where a protein known as reflectin is found to be localized in the sheath cells that surrounds the pigment sac. And this is critical because reflectin is known to form periodic structures that functions as a diffraction grating to disperse light for structural coloration. Then they extracted the granules from the pigment sac they extracted the pigments from these granules, and finally, they performed proteomics across these three different elements. And here we find another key piece of the puzzle. Another protein called crystalline is found to be heavily localized in the granules. So what this means is that we have a very distinct localization of two different sorts of proteins. Firstly, we have our reflectin in the sheath cells, and we have crystalline in the pigment granules. Now the function of crystal, uh, sorry, the function of reflectin is pretty clear uh, from what I've mentioned, right? They form periodic structures for, uh, uh, to act as a diffraction, gra uh, diffraction grading. So this leads us to ask, what is the structure function relationship of crystalline? So to answer this question, we will need to dig deeper into the molecular details, which are usually beyond the means of experimental methods. And therefore, we use multi-scale computational modeling to complement this whole suite of studies that were done by my uh, experimental collaborators. And as this is the very first comprehensive proteomics of the squid chromatophore, the protein structures of crystalline and reflectin are still unknown. And therefore, I turn to homology modeling to provide an initial prediction of the structures. And then I refine the predicted structures using replica exchange molecular dynamics, uh, as I described earlier. Now, with these different predicted structures in hand, I can actually analyze a very, very wide variety of the structure function relationships of these uh, particular proteins. And here are some of the uh, structures for reflectin and crystalline. And basically what we found is that the reflectin monomer has a very large number of random linker regions uh, as shown by these strands uh, over here. And this suggests that the structures are very flexible. And in contrast, Crystalline over here is highly globular, and therefore it is likely to be structurally rigid. And because of this rigidity, we imagine that crystalline will have suitable pockets for pigment molecules to bind, which may explain why crystalline exists exclusively in the pigment granules. And to verify this, I perform molecular docking simulations, where the premise is, of course, to minimize an energy function where I perform global rigid docking with limited degrees of freedom to search for potential binding pockets. And then I perform the flexible docking in the local region with multiple degrees of freedom. And from these docking results, we found stronger binding to crystalline than to reflectin. And intuitively, the reason is very apparent. 
right? The pigment molecule docks in deep pockets within crystalline and therefore is actually able to form very elaborate networks of hydrophobic interactions given by the eyelashes and polar interactions given by the lines. And in contrast, the pigment molecule actually docks very superficially onto the surface of reflectin and the network of interactions are therefore much less elaborate. And the possible role of crystalline as a good pigment repository is further reinforced by the fact that they are very similar to a class of proteins known as aldehyde dehydrogenases, which are able to form higher order structures such as tetramers. So if we were to construct tetramers of crystalline and perform the same docking, an even greater amount of pigment molecules can potentially be stored within the crystalline tetramer. So we can clearly see the importance of crystalline localizing only in the pigment granules. And therefore, we would like to ask one more question. How may crystalline oligomerize further to eventually form a granule? And to identify possible mechanisms for crystalline aggregation, I mapped the electrostatic surface of the crystalline tetramer using finite element methods, which accounts for solvent effects, charge distribution, as well as steric interactions. And what we found is a very, very strong separation in the electrostatic potential, where a high electrostatic potential, given by the blue regions, indicates that there's a relative absence of electrons. And a low electrostatic uh, potential that are given by the red regions indicates an abundance of electrons. So given this very, very clear separation in the electrostatic potential, we can conceive of a mechanistic pathway where the individual tetramers could coacervate where the blue regions come into contact with the red regions to form a protein pigment superstructure. And we are right now, we are probing this using Cosgrain molecular dynamic simulations. And therefore, this actually leads us to one final crucial question. Why then do the pigment molecules need to be stored in this manner? And to answer this question, we dove into the final piece of the puzzle, the pigment molecule itself. Now, by monitoring the absorptive capabilities of synthetic pigment molecules by themselves, we found that above a pH of 3.6, there is a transition in the color. And by calculating the absorption spectra using DFT calculations, this transition was attributed to the fact that at low pH, the protonation of the molecule actually caused it to kink and therefore altered its optical properties. And for the final proof of the pudding, the pH is varied for the extracted pigment molecules and the granules. And now we no longer see any transition in the absorption spectra because both of these are rich in crystalline. Now we verify the vital protective role of crystalline monomerization to stabilize and protect the pigment molecules. Now to summarize what I've discussed so far, we would like to create a highly dynamic uh, coloration, uh, particularly for dermal displays, and therefore we draw bioinspiration from the squid scheme. And we elucidated the fundamental structures and optical functions of the squid chromatophore to explore and explain the importance of crystalline localization to store and protect the pigment molecules for robust coloration, while another protein called reflectin confers iridescence to the chromatophores. And this combination of mechanisms actually gives squid their complex and adaptive coloration. And eventually, of course, we hope to translate these mechanisms into low power thermal bioelectronics with low energy dissipation. And therefore, our next step is to really figure out the optical properties of the chromatophore complex as a whole. How does the entire system of reflecting, crystalline, and pigment molecules interact with incoming light and dynamically re emit them so that we can eventually design biomaterials with dynamic and tunable optical properties? And all these different directions that I've highlighted for silk, elastin, and squid proteins feeds into my overall vision for this uh, cohesive multi-scale design platform. And right now we are layering on concepts from machine learned models for structure prediction, as well as uh, for molecular dynamic simulations. And we are also looking into different forms of polarizable molecular dynamic simulations for optical properties and different sorts of adaptive multi-scale uh, methods to characterize the electrical properties as well. And eventually, I will couple all of these phenomena together to characterize the full dynamic multistimular response of the biomaterial. But achieving this in a single linear fashion is still not the ultimate goal, right? We are instead, what we are really looking to do is something that looks more like this. <laughs> 
high throughput design of customized protein sequence or any other form of biopolymeric sequences to predict their multi-scale structures and then to characterize their dynamic functions uh, in such a high throughput manner. And of course, to achieve this, I will not be uh, achieving such a challenging vision alone. And instead, I'm building very close interdisciplinary collaborations in order for us to design this next generation of soft biomaterials for global health. And finally, I would like to uh, give a shout out to uh, all the sponsors of my research, uh, such as uh, the Cornell China Center, as well as uh, in NSF. But it has been definitely my honor and pleasure to stand here and be able to present my research uh, online to the wonderful audience of the Mullet Society. And all these achievements simply couldn't have happened without some uh, incredible good luck uh, of, and the opportunity to swim with the best and stand on the shoulders of some really tall giants. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much, uh, especially to uh, uh, Mullet Society, uh, Society and Dr. Yin for the uh, uh, nice uh, uh, invitation, as well as the excellent uh, platform for uh, young scholars to be able to present their research as well. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, JJ, for the great talk. Now we're open for questions. Okay, there's one question from Lando McLenklin. Is there experimental evidence showing direct binding between crystalline and refracting? Also, the known stoichiometry of the interaction and the oligomerization. Uh, I would say that the uh, the basically crystalline and reflecting are both localized in different uh, regions of the cell itself. So in the shift cells, uh, as we can see over here, which are all these uh, protrusions that's coming out from the central region, right? This is where we find the reflecting. And reflecting tends to form, dynamically form uh, different kinds of beta sheets uh, from the uh, coil structures that we saw, right? Based on the amount of water content uh, in the cell. And that's where they are localized. Whereas the crystalline is actually within uh, the middle over here where you find the pigment granules and that's where they form all these different granules to be able to protect the pigment molecules uh, to provide chromatic coloration. So these are diff two different uh, mechanisms and they are localized in two different areas. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. So they don't directly bind to each other. Instead, they are both different uh, proteins that forms uh, different structures for different sorts of optical properties. So because I did my PhD from the silk lab, so no matter when it's my supervisor going to give a talk or like the student give a talk, usually the first question is why silk? It's yeah. almost become a like internal joke. And every yeah. time in between us, my supervisor just say, why not? Because people yeah. don't really know this ancient material so much so well. So can yep. you like comment a little bit on that? Why silk? Yeah, so in, in my opinion, uh, so uh, uh, why silk is basically silk itself, uh, as I've mentioned, is an ancient material, right? It's been used for centuries, if not millennia. And what this means is that we both know how to produce silk in very large quantities for scalability. We know how to process it, and we know very intricately all the different properties that we can get from it, right? And what this means is that this becomes extremely flexible for a lot of different applications. And as you can tell, uh, we are even uh, using new forms of processing that were not available to us before, new forms of functionalization that were not available to us before. And we built on this really centuries of knowledge on silk in order to produce uh, new forms of biological properties. And the fact that uh, silk has all these uh, properties of biodegradability, biocompatibility, and being renewable that makes it an even stronger for many, many different kinds of applications. And therefore, I, that's why I see Silk as a very fundamental platform that can be used to build on an even greater variety uh, of uh, uh, biomedical devices. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, JJ. So I have, a, also, I have a question. So yeah. basically, we know that there is a huge design space in biomaterials. So mm -hmm. sometimes we, we start from some de, de novo uh, amino acid sequence design, mm -hmm. but we know there are 20 types of basic amino acids. So, but at larger scale, as you mentioned, so how do we identify the, the parameters that we can 
uh, play with uh, in this huge design space uh, to get better barrier materials in a larger scale. Mm, so I think that that question uh, tends to be a bit more specific to the particular property they are, uh, that you are looking at. So even though we have 20 amino acid sequences, but even then a lot of the properties at that scale are actually not discovered yet, right? So if you, if you look into a protein data bank, uh, the vast majority of those protein structures are all globular proteins, right? Which means that things like fibrous proteins, such as silk, such as keratin, such as collagen are actually underrepresented in that data bank. And what this means is that those properties at that scale are already not as uh, well covered, uh, let's say, at the molecular uh, level. Now, if we were to go up to the mesoscale level, then in my opinion, what we need to look at is to be more specific in the sort of properties that we are looking at. So uh, if we are looking particularly in the mechanical properties, then we have to understand at the lower level what confers such a mechanical properties and then be able to translate these mechanisms up to a much larger scale. And similarly for optical properties, how do we actually translate what's happening at the molecular level up onto a mesoscale level to understand uh, better how these uh, mechanisms actually translate to the mesoscale. So by understanding this connection between the scales, then we can hope to be able to uh, utilize the mesoscale structures and mesoscale interactions to be able to design new forms uh, of materials. Yeah. Okay, another question from me. So for stimuli responsive biomaterials, um, how do you comment the relation between the stimulation and experimental? Because a lot of things we can just, maybe it takes some time, but we can try all the formulas. Then we can directly see and characterize the response. Then we know maybe silk one elastin eight will give the best temporary responses. Mm -hmm. So your model will predict that. But do you think it comes before the experiment or is actually a way to validate the experimental results afterwards? Yeah, I think it, uh, this actually goes both ways. So usually what we look more into is uh, integrative kind of a platform between experimental, uh, experimental methods and computational methods. Uh, so it goes basically in a circular loop where you have your experimental design coupled to your uh, computational design, right? So we can use that as a validation or use that as a predictive capability. So this goes in both ways. And right now we are even looking into how we can fit this all into a, a, a compiled kind of a database. And from data, this database, we hope to be able to uh, perform different kinds of machine learning to be able to um, accelerate this sort of uh, prediction. But definitely the experimental methods and the computational methods are coupled uh, in a circular manner. Yeah. Do you see the possibility in the near future that we can totally have the reverse design for biomaterials? Yep, absolutely. And that's definitely one of the key areas that we are working on. And uh, uh, we are getting, uh, well, at least we are getting to some initial results. And hopefully I can, uh, maybe if I have the opportunity to present again next year, uh, I can come back and tell you more about uh, the new results that we have uh, pertaining to this particular uh, area. Yeah, can't wait for that day. Yeah, thank because you. Because experiment definitely takes a lot of like try and error times and mm -hmm. Yeah, if we have a model that can back up and our design, that would be much faster and save time. Yep, absolutely. We have another question from Glenda. So mm -hmm. the wife uh, refringence of silk suggests a semi-crystalline molecular array. So however, however, the MD calculated structure shows disordered features. How do you resolve this? Yeah, so uh, I, I would actually agree that it's semi-crystalline. So if I can go back to where that was. Yep, so we did in fact find that by using different sorts of uh, solvent processing, we did induce different sorts of uh, semi-crystalline semi structures in terms of an increase in the number of beta sheet content, as well as the greater formation of hydrogen bonds. And this kind of indirectly points towards uh, having this uh, semi-crystalline molecular arrangement. And of course, the limitation of molecular dynamics here is that we can only really look at really small clusters uh, of silk. But what we primarily use this is to actually uh, uh, characterize the, the ability of our different solvents uh, to produce these different sorts of molecular arrangements. So therefore, I, I, I uh, agree with what you said that there is, in fact, a semi-crystalline uh, semi molecular arrangements by inducing different forms of beta, strip, uh, beta sheet formation within the silk itself. Mm 
Thank you so much for the answer. I think next question is from Xiaoshan. So if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, hey, um, uh, thanks for, for the excellent talk. It's very interesting. Um, I, I just have a quick question. So um, since you're doing um, a bottom-up design and you have a um, great uh, design strategy, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering um, how, how would you make sure, so, so, you, so you do the uh, machine learning um, and MD simulations to study the uh, properties of the um, uh, structures, but how do you have a strategy of making sure that the design or the simulation is actually manufacturable? So um, do you have a, also a strategy to make sure the result you have is actually can be um, uh, consensus uh, uh, in the lab or for a larger scale manufacturing? Mm -hmm. So again, this goes back to the previous uh, question by Dr. Lee on how we actually look at computational methods versus experimental methods. So a lot of what we do in computation are actually constrained by what the experimentalists will tell us. So we don't exist in two separate bubbles, right? We have to keep talking to each other and we say that, look, um, uh, doing such a modification will induce such a property. And then the experimentalists come back and say, tell us that this is actually not very biocompatible or this is actually not a good strategy for uh, scaling. And then we take that into account account uh, and try to uh, readjust and redesign. And this, this is actually a very collaborative uh, process. So a lot of these limitations are uh, already inherently kind of uh, used as constraints on our simulations as well. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, we also have a question uh, when people uh, uh, ask in the registration. So, the question is, are uh, your simulation codes open source? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of my key philosophy is to always use open source software, right? And then we will add on to that open source software in order to contribute back to the community. So a lot of my research have already very greatly uh, uh, benefited from uh, software that's open source. And therefore what we are trying to do now is to give back and pay forward and to be able to implement new, capabil uh, new capabilities into all these open source software. So right now, even whether we are working on different kinds of polymers or different kinds of biopolymers, we are actually generating a lot of our initial uh, model structures or force fields using this uh, open source platform. And eventually I hope to be able to uh, contribute a lot more you know, to the development of this software as well. Yeah, I think this is a very practical question and a lot of people are very interested in. Can you quickly comment what software you're using and your code, mm -hmm. where can people have access to it? Yeah, so most of these simulations are ran either uh, basically almost, I would say, the big three of, uh, of uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, which is NAMD, Gromax, and LAMPS. Uh, so the vast majority are based off that. Uh, the, actually, the, the actual secret source is not in the uh, software that runs the simulations. In, instead, I think the secret source is actually how you set up the different sorts of simulations. So this is a lot more complex and a lot more involved, and it really requires quite a bit more uh, on experience uh, rather than you know relying on a particular uh, software. So definitely, if there's any uh, questions or if you like some tips on how I constructed some of these models, you know, feel free to reach out, and we are we are happy to talk about it as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Do we have any further questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, please, Jen. Uh, Jen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm quite interested in the molecular dynamics, although I have never uh, worked on this um, before. Uh, because I noticed that for molecular dynamics simulations, you usually work on very small scales. Mm -hmm. So, um, but how do you validate your model with actually two experiments? Mm -hmm. It's going to be impossible to do any, I mean, direct experiment validations on that uh, land scale, I guess. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I totally agree. So uh, molecular dynamics, we have to look at things from a more complementary uh, perspective. So we definitely do not hope that molecular dynamic simulations reproduces exactly what experimental, uh, what experimental method does, right? Of course, we try to achieve that wherever possible, but Asking for that seems to uh, not be harnessing the strength of either of those methods, right? So we are trying to use molecular dynamic simulations as a complement to what experiments cannot do. And therefore, definitely, we understand that there's always be 
this uh, coupling issue where uh, you get results in ND simulations that are not directly validated by experiments. And therefore, what we can really hope to achieve is to have some sort of indirect validation. And I've shown uh, previously in some of my slides, we have looked at a lot on the secondary structures. We have looked at indirect uh, information such as the radius of variation, the solvent accessibility. Uh, and a lot of these are not necessarily directly correlated or rather not directly uh, validated by experiments, but we can, in fact, uh, use this as a form of correlation with experiments. And of course, we have to ensure that this correlation is robust, and we have to ensure that uh, this also fits with um, previous literature as well, right? So uh, we have to use multiple methods to do this sort of uh, validation, but definitely I don't think uh, the strength of molecular dynamics simulations is on exactly reproducing what you can find in experiments. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and a great talk. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So if we think about the big picture, you think doing a study on biomaterials will have impact on healthcare, soft robotics, et cetera. So are there any like specific applications, demonstrations you'd love to see that realizing the near future? Mm -hmm. I would say like right now um, we are still on well if you if you look at the uh, uh, the translational level uh, what we are mostly working on is probably still towards the the uh, very initial conceptualization kind of a stage so basically we are still uh, looking at molecular details, um, trying to modify the biomaterials and be able to produce different uh, effects in the materials. And uh, definitely one of my hope is to be able to be more involved in uh, finding out how we can actually apply these materials to actual applications. Uh, but right now we are still, I guess we are still in the midst of more, more theoretical understanding. And once we have a much firmer understanding of that, then we can hope to uh, be able to couple that uh, on a much higher uh, device manufacturing kind of a, a scale. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jinji. So we have another question from Gladden. So simulation uh, so, uh, so were performed in non-aqueous solvents. So were you able to perform in water? Yeah, uh, so that's, that's a great question. So actually very, very fundamentally, all biomolecular simulations are generally uh, based on water, right? So the novelty here is actually being able to solve it in non-aqueous solvents and be able to show what happens when you add other forms of solvents. That is actually the uh, main uh, novelty of, of what I've done so far. But definitely uh, H2O is, is probably one of the fundamental solvents that we can use in biomolecular simulations. Yeah, because usually the solvent will have some kind of impact on the secondary structure of mm -hmm. the yeah. protein, right? Exactly. Okay, based on your industry experience, what do you think is the most challenging thing for the mass production of the biomaterials you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think uh, the first key thing is to be able to uh, have companies that are able to implement this sort of uh, techniques, right? So right now, the, the main barrier in industry is generally that you would use an existing platform and an existing material that they use already very heavily and they are very, very sure that it's scalable, right? And then to apply this, to tweak this a little to be able to produce uh, new stuff from it. So generally it's a lot harder to get established companies to uh, implement new forms of materials uh, and new forms of uh, manufacturing. So that mm -hmm. is either going to take a lot of time or this is going to be based on startups. So definitely I think in the startup space, uh, especially for silk proteins, uh, for uh, a lot of these bio-based uh, materials, a lot of startups have been uh, going a lot more into this space. You know, you have companies like Bolt Threads uh, looking into mycelium and silk. We have, um, uh, I can't recall some of the names, but definitely there are uh, a lot of startups that are able to disrupt, you know, this sort of ma uh, material synthesis basically because they are starting from scratch. And it's going to be a lot harder for established companies to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can remember it's very hard in our lab, we're trying to transfer from beaker to beaker to a larger beaker. Yep. Because even the volume, the size of beaker change, there are a lot of problems coming to, like mm. temperature yep. control and yeah. 
You yeah, and that's where, yeah. yeah, that's where I think a lot of the inter more interdisciplinary studies uh, into materials can really help a lot, right? So if, if you look at the a lot of the ways that we bulk produce proteins are now using bioreactors, and that means we bring in a lot of chemical engineers. We have to also look at more of biology, how we can use synthetic biology to be able to uh, get greater yield. You know, from uh, dif different uh, bioreactors as well. So I think uh, materials research should be a lot more interdisciplinary and by using all these different techniques then we can hope to make things a lot more scalable yeah exactly okay, okay. i don't see more questions so uh, if there's no more questions and... yes yes so thanks jj again for for coming and give us this wonderful talk and thanks for all for coming and ask these great questions i think uh, we can conclude this uh, great uh, talk and have a great weekend. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks to uh, uh, Mother Society and uh, for the excellent organization as well. And of course, thanks to the uh, audience for uh, really excellent questions as well. So thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this talk as well. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Great talk. All right. Bye. Have a great weekend, Bye. everybody. Thank yeah, you. Have a great weekend.